Welcome to your Public Works and Gang Reduction Committee. I am joined by my colleagues, Council Member uh, Rue Buscaino and O'Farrell. Ms. Martinez will not be joining us today. She is excused. Um, we have a number of items. Uh, however, I have one uh, public comment card on multiple items, so I would like to uh, bring up Mr. Spindler first. And Good. Chairman. Blah, blah, so, and uh, blah. Two, two minutes on the items and then one minute for a general public comment. Yes, so today we look at number three. We're going to have a new rule written by Joe Buscaino, the cop with the silver tongue. And from environmental determinations from certain non elected decision makers. So, what's this? What evil is lurking in the room today? Yes, council member Blob Blob and Blold just took and nearly lost some hair on that one. It's going to be more sneakiness and more deceit, but good news for developers. See, developers like this, developers wrote it. It was written for developers, by developers, at the suggestion of developers to help get them around EIRs and the environmental determinations. Why? because they have to get paid by you, the developers. These people have to get campaign donations. They have to get donations to their nonprofits and their office holder accounts. They also have to get jobs for their family members, but they can't do it unless you build, build, build. And we got to build, 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 because blah, blah, blob and blild has to keep building more and more and more garbage and more and more without parking. We got to build as fast as we can. We got to build as quick as we can. Fuck the environmental impacts. Fuck the California sequel. We just got to keep ramming those projects through faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster as fast as we can build that shit as fast as we can go unaffordable non-rent controlled unaffordable fucking housing with no fucking parking we gotta go as fast as we can we gotta build this shit fuck the taxpayers and fuck the voters so yes that's why it'll pass and then the one minute jesus christ Joe, the silver tongue cop, Blas Gallino, throws poor little Antonio Ramirez out of a meeting. Now you know this, what this, happened? This has to be relevant to yes, it things is. beyond in this Public committee. Public works and gang reduction. Because what you're doing is you're turning Antonio Ramirez into a gang member. Because did you know, under your rule written by your city attorney, that she's on a second probation? So she can't go to any more meetings today with you fuckers and has to miss the Friday meeting. This is the casualties. This is why you'll get more people to join me to become little niggers just like me that are going to talk like me and they're going to walk like me. Pretty soon, you're not going to know who the real me me is. Will the real Wade Spindler please stand up? Fuck you. Thank you. Now move on and have our meeting. Uh, colleagues, unless there is an objection, uh, I'd like to move items four, five, and seven, eight, nine, and ten on consent. Seeing, seeing no objections, that will be the order. Uh, we'll hold item six for the moment as we have an amendment by the department uh, that we will take care of. In fact, why don't we just take care of that right now and do number six. Uh, is the Department ready for that? We can just dispense with that quickly. Item number six, there is a, an amendment proposed. Hi, thank Crocker with the Bureau of Engineering. And I'm here uh, to do the technical correction, request a technical correction for the council file 170857. It's a for vacation VAC 1401315. And it's a park drive and portion of northwesterly side from the approximately 260 feet southwesterly of Baxter Street to approximately 323 feet southwesterly of Baxter Street. So we would like to do the technical correction by 
WOE to the city engineer report dated November 13, 2017. Recommendation A shall read as follows. That street vacation proceeding pursuant to the street, public street highway and service easement vacation law be instituted for the vaca vacation of the public right of way indicated below and shown color blue on the attached exhibit C. The northwesterly 55 feet of Park Drive from approximately 260 feet southwesterly of Baxter Street to approximately 323 feet southwesterly of Baxter Street. And all subsequent uh, references to Exhibit B shall be changed to Exhibit C. So basically, BOE allow additional five more feet of right-of-way area to be vacated. Great. Thank you. And we will, uh, without objection, we will approve that as amended. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll move to uh, item number one. And uh, Mr. Espinosa, if you would read that into the record, and we'll have uh, Jenny Holm from ITA come to the podium. Bianca. <laughs> Item number one is a report from the City Administrative Officer relative to the Innovation and Performance Commission Innovation Fund funding for the City Idea Hub project from the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. This was also referred to the Personnel and Animal Welfare Committee. Wait. It's number one. Good afternoon, everyone, and I also would like to say happy Juneteenth. I'm Bianca Swan, project coordinator for the Innovation and Performance Commission. The commission is recommending funding for $150,000 for the City Idea Hub pilot. This pilot, a partnership between the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment and the Information Technology Agency, proposes the integration of an innovation management software tool that will help consolidate and drive the city's civic engagement efforts. Through this pilot, both departments aim to provide a data-rich, metric-rich approach to collaboration and innovation, amplifying the voices of the city's residents regarding information and issues that may impact them, their communities, and the city as a whole. I'm joined by representatives ITA and uh, Dunn, who will give more information and more details, and we're both available to answer questions. Thank you. Hi, Jean Holm, Assistant Manager at the uh, Information Technology Agency. Um, Idea Scale is an interesting project that allows us to interact with the public or internally in different ways than we normally do. So we currently have products like Google Forums, we have uh, SurveyMonkey that let us either let people have an open conversation or let people answer specific questions that we've asked. What Idea Scale does is it actually allows us to uh, allow ideas to come up and then allow people to interact around the ideas. So it's a semi-structured way of doing this. Um, I have experience working with this before when I was with the White House on challenge.gov. And it was a really robust tool to be able to hold at a national level even, sort of community engagement that really got focused in on the subject as opposed to sort of diverting into a lot of site conversations. It allows uh, different departments to look at ide ideation in different ways. Uh, currently, it's being used within DWP and LAWA for internal ideation. And in fact, the way that we would look at funding this in the future if this pilot was, um, was working is to actually pool the funds. So we'd be able to get funds from DWP, LAWA to augment city funds to be able to lift it up to a citywide um, structure. It's a cloud-hosted project, so it's a pretty light lift for ITA to administer. And we do it the same way we currently do Hootsuite for social media or Google for email. Um, and then what we'd want to do is be able to partner with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment to have a person who can help manage the campaigns and help to be able to let different departments as they're looking at how to create these uh, campaigns either internally or externally to be able to engage the public in really meaningful ways. The great thing about idea scale is behind the scenes, we get lots and lots of data. So we know what people are interested in, we know what they kind of congregate around, and we know sort of uh, how to start guiding that conversation in a way that can really be productive. I think Jean provided a, a great update in terms of uh, what the project is, as, as well as our role in it, and we're happy to answer any questions at this point. My first question would be if you could dumb it down a little bit for for uh, for us here on the panel in terms of give us like a real world example how this is different than SurveyMonkey, uh, how how the ideation happens. Uh, like I love the concept in from the thirty thousand foot level, but I'm having trouble getting it in my head as what it really is. Sure. 
So, um, so I'll use two examples. One is from LAWA, the way it's being used today, kind of within the city family, and another one uh, sort of with challenge.gov. So LAWA has an innovation hangar. That's what they call their idea scale space. And what they're able to do is ask people questions about what would be your suggestion for the best idea around. And it could be around getting people to move faster through LAX, being able to move baggage faster, um, working with getting traffic issues. So they can focus a specific um, area. When people create a pr uh, an idea, rather than just being answered in a survey and kind of sent to the s survey manager, it becomes an idea that is presented to the community graphically. So it sort of looks like a dashboard, and people are able to quickly upvote, downvote, add ideas, um, have a conversation behind it. And so it's a really easy way to graphically bring people together. SurveyMonkey, on the other hand, kind of like we would ask them questions. They would give us the responses to those questions, and we would get the answers to specific things. But we wouldn't necessarily be able to have people share that with each other or be able to kind of build off of each other's ideas. On challenge.gov, we do this around um, trying to get kids engaged with how to recruit the next generation of folks to the government service. And so we did a video challenge, and we had kids post videos that they thought would get other young kids to want to have government service. Like, because government is cool, right? <laughs> and so then people could upvote or downvote the different videos and be able to make comments, but you can also moderate it, so you can kind of have a guided discussion about so, it. So how is it different, let's say, than Facebook, where you have people uploading, downloading, commenting, voting, thumbs up, thumbs down? So one thing is it allows, uh, if, if you want to, you can anonymize it. So people could make these comments anonymously if they wanted to, or they could vote anonymously, so you wouldn't necessarily have to have somebody share the concern that maybe by logging into Facebook, they're sort of identifying themselves. And the other thing too is it allows people who aren't on a specific social media platform. You can do engagement around Twitter, you can do engagement on Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook, but in all of those cases you end up having this conversation that can go wide ranging as opposed to be focused in on, okay, so we're really looking at this idea or how to get traffic moving faster rather than just sort of this wide range of concerns about traffic in general. How, how does it winnow those ideas down as opposed to Facebook where people start going off on different tangents. How is it, is it a human moderator or is it a robot moderate, moderator? It's a, so it's, it's a human plan. Um, so you can actually just decide you want to post the 12 ideas you want around, say, issues around picking up trash. So you could post 12 ideas that you think are the best ideas that you've heard and let people just congregate around those 12 ideas. You don't have to necessarily let people pitch their own ideas, or you could put the ability for people to pitch, but do it in a structured way. So they'd have to kind of fill out certain things, but um, which would then present that as a project. Um, the other thing that that idea scale does is it gives you a workflow in the background. So say you have these 12 ideas, and now you want to take two of those because they've been very popular, and you want to mature them into actual projects. So you ab have the ability in the background to be able to approve those as projects, move them through another workflow that lets you actually manage them as actual tasks in the background. So it takes it from the very beginning of ideation all the way to project management. I have a, I have a bunch more questions, but I know my colleagues want to ask some questions. Buscano? No, yeah, they actually had the same question, Mr. Chair, that you had. Um, right now, in my district, in the Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council, they're debating um, to keep the, the fire ring pits at Cabrillo Beach or to not keep the fire pits at Cabrillo Beach. And what we're seeing now is an ongoing debate um, happening on Facebook um, and they have their own surveys. So you're telling me um, with this innovation fund recommendation uh, through the City Idea Hub effort, you're going to be replacing these types of surveys happening online in various social media avenues. Uh, I don't know that it replaces. I think that sure. council offices and departments should feel encouraged to interact with the public in ways that are meaningful and that get them feedback that they want. IdeaScale provides a, a structured way of doing that for specific kinds of things where we're really trying to get to a specific decision. Um, I would always encourage people to reach out to their constituents in any way that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wouldn't necessarily be like, we're going to do this and not do that. Let's just, um it's forward thinking, it's exciting innovation. 
My only concern is like if someone in this case of the Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council uh, surveying the community, if someone from Silmar is going to chime in, <laughs> it doesn't even live in, it's not a stakeholder, it doesn't live in the, um, in the San Pedro area, um, you, you won't be able to control that. Yeah, so you can set it up in different ways. So r normally it's in an, an anonymized way, but you could also have it require it to be a login and maybe like identify your zip code or identify oh, okay. that you're a part of the council uh, district. There's a certain amount of trust, you know, that would be um, in implicit in that. And will this be run by the department? I see Gracie here, or would it be run by the neighbor council members? Or how's it gonna be um, mobilized and? Well, initially, um, this this is a pilot, and we are using it with um, city departments to do their own internal and external um, ideation projects. Uh, if it's successful, we will look at expanding it beyond neighbor council to neighbor councils. Um, the goal of the department in this pilot phase is to actually create the campaign around that to help city departments implement that. Thank you. So it would, and it would be open to anybody. Um, so for as an example, we have several people who signed up for potential early campaigns. One is the Mayor's Office of Public Safety wants to have some ideation around Shake Alert LA to try to understand how to improve that. Um, the Innovation Performance Commission itself is interested in using this as a way of eliciting um, ideas and ideation. Um, ITA is looking at it around smart cities and how departments, so that might be an internal and an external kind of um, ideation. And then of course uh, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. But it would be open during this pilot to anybody who wants to. My fault. So this is all done, it's going to be done internally through the, the city departments and not necessarily directly through neighborhood councils just yet. This is the whole pilot. Okay. We'd, we would probably initially start with city departments and then depending on the, um, the issues that we sure. see, then we would roll it out to neighborhood councils so that we can make sure that it's success, successful because it would be 99 neighborhood councils citywide and that might be a little difficult to, to help make sure that we are have success. Thanks. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Mr. So, um, and, and the user of this is, is any city department or council office, correct? Correct. So it's, it's what we're literally signing off on is basically the licensing of right. this software. Right. Exactly. Um, and to try to use it in innovative ways. Um, what kind of user information would be collected by IdeaSpace? So for, um, as uh, council member Buscaino said, if you don't want, if you want to leave it as anonymized, you wouldn't necessarily collect anything people would be able to upvote and downvote, kind of like on a Reddit model. Um, but if you wanted to maybe have people express what district they're in or what zip code or some other information, then there would be a login. And all of that would be collected is whatever we, whoever's running the campaign would decide. So it could simply be their zip code. Or it could be, you know, their age and their zip code. Um, so the only information we would collect is whatever the campaign manager, council office or department, felt was needed in order to answer the questions. And uh, you say camp the word campaign, it gets me nervous in this context. I'll call it Sorry. initiative just because this is politics and government. We don't want initiative? to campaigns. But uh, give us an example of what some of these campaigns would be or initiatives would be. Sure. So let me talk about the Shake Alert LA one because I'm pretty familiar with that one. So with Shake Alert LA, we have a mobile app. It's very popular, 500,000 downloads. But we know there's ways to improve it. And there's been some discussion about whether or not we want to kind of make it more easy to use. And we currently have it in English and Spanish. So we might open that as a campaign to say, what additional languages would you want this to be in? Uh, we could also uh, put a, uh, so in this campaign we would have additional languages. We would have what additional features do you feel like it's making you safer? So we could have a variety of things which people could create ideas around in order to be able to find out exactly how we want to improve the app itself. All right, and then so you, that's kind of like a survey, but you're saying but people talk about the different ideas and it all goes back to the central, whoever put it out to, to read through all of the comments and all of the, I mean, is it helping you uh, process all the information as well or it's just a form? Yeah, so there's analytics in the background, visualizations and other data analytics that allow us to be able to understand what percentage of the population responded to certain aspects of the, of the 
initiative or the idea hub and other places where we could um, just say we just want upvotes and downvotes around these different kinds of features so we can find out what would be the next three most popular features to add to the application. But other people would be able to, like the public would be able to see this so they might be able to sort of riff off of each other and be able to understand. It's a very transparent way of, of doing this kind of thing so that especially with ShakeAlert LA, the Mayor's Office of Public Safety is really interested in having a lot of transparency. And so they want to make sure that if these are the most popular features, that it's very clear that people voted on those. All right, colleagues, any additional questions or comments? Uh, I'm going to propose we, we move forward with this and we'll see, see how it works and, and hopefully the innovation will come from people using it innovatively and uh, in different ways to get, to get more. So I'd love to get a report back at some point when this has been in place of how it's working. And, and I guess the last thing, metrics for success on this is just whether people use it. Yeah, so our metrics for success is um, we're currently planning on doing the number of departments or elected offices trained to create campaigns, the number of city of LA and elected official staff that are participating and the number of public participating, the number of initiatives launched and completed, the engagement on the topics, which is where the data analytics comes around. So are we getting a lot of people, you know, kind of participating in these? Um, and really looking at the ideas and the votes that come in. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So um, recommendation is to approve the uh, CAO's report and instruct uh, Dunn with assistance from ITA to report on the success of the pilot after the pilot's completion. Thank you very much. That'll take us to item number two. Item number two is a report from the Bureau of Street Services relative to the fiscal year 2019-20 Veiled Street Reconstruction. This was also referred to the Transportation Committee. Good afternoon, John Saponi, Streets LA. I'm accompanied by Janet Tran, who's our, uh, in our payment management section. Talk to you about our Veiled Street plan here that's going to involve uh, not only the science but also the human element to determine what streets we do here. <clears throat> so as we start out here, we start out with our budget, which is approximately six point, or $16.6 .6 million. That's going to be adopted in the next year's budget. Uh, based on that, with our allocation for that, we will move on to a allocation among all the CDs split up evenly, which is about $1.1 .1 million. And on that, we will start the implementation of the projects that we have uh, that are good to go July 1st. So the process on this slide shows basically it starts with the budget. After that, we use the science part, which is our micropaver system. After we do that, we go into our fact that we check the uh, uh, streets that qualify through the micropaver against actual uh, our powers or reservation system through Bureau of Engineering, as well as coordinate with uh, Department of Water Power and also the uh, any other outside agencies that we have that may have projects to prevent us to do streets. After we get a good handful of streets, we move on to the physical part, which our teams go out and physically look at the streets, determine the data, and determine that they are good to go to be a street that qualifies for the failed street program. The next part of it is developing a program by budget allocation, and then we meet with the actual council office to show the streets that qualify their district and discuss the work plan uh, involved. Once we do that, we start to implement the project and complete the project and execute the final uh, based on the budget allocation. So this next slide shows an example of our street survey van that first goes and drives the streets with a PCI of 40 below. It comes back, or I should say just drives the streets to determine the streets that are 40 below to qualify. Uh, it's dependent on the fact that it has the street distress type, the severity of the stress, and the quantity of the stress on the street. We have a street that we call, uh, an item we call a street pulse that we add into that, which you'll see later, to determine the PCI, as well as the street selection. And the first example, the streets in red are all the streets that show that qualify. But when you overlay the water power element, some other uh, uh, conflicts that we could have, it's, it's a little difficult to, to get actual clean projects. But even with that, we are still able to uh, get a good uh, amount of streets that we're able to perform the work on. Next is the selection. So we do a grid method, which is kind of part of our uh, multi-year program. 
And what we do is we uh, coordinate with DOT as well as other agencies and their programs to, that include uh, bike lanes. We also coordinate with the Complete Streets program to not have any conflicts. And we get input from stakeholders. <coughs> so the selection of streets is basically a street pulse. And what that consists of is the actual micropaver data, our LA 301 requests, our number of pothole requests, and litigation payout. Using the grid selection, the, the benefits of it is it cost effective to, for the mobilization and demobilization. It also improves the service to the customer. It also has, uh, it allows us to uh, have a better future maintenance uh, cycle. And it also improves the district as a PCI in a whole. So reconstruction. So full reconstruction is an example here where we use uh, uh, overlay pavement designs provided by us through the Department of General Services. And as part of the failed street, it's the full uh, removal of the uh, actual asphalt and structure and being, becoming a full replacement uh, of it to have full reconstruction. We also will use a contractor to perform some reconstruction through asphalt streets. And we also, in this program, will implement some uh, concrete panel replacement. Those are uh, also be determined as part of the uh, concrete street report. The next page shows basically you an allocation of, or I should say the, uh, uh, the distress, how much uh, percentage we have in failed streets in the asphalt, as well as concrete. And the uh, uh, concrete, uh, when, when we do uh, determine the uh, concrete street uh, work on failed streets, that allocation will be done uh, through the uh, allocation process, not uh, divided evenly. On the last slide, it shows the fact that uh, how we do our multi-year, and as you can see that our grid process is kind of implemented here through the various types of work, which will include slurry seal, our uh, reconstruction, our regular uh, resurfacing, and as well as our uh, uh, CIR projects, uh, uh, CIR projects that we have. So in, in a whole that uh, we are, we have a lot of uh, data that we look at, and we do try to do a lot, well, we do do a lot of coordinating with the actual council offices to determine the best, uh, best uh, street to pick for that uh, meets as well theirs as well as ours for the program. Great. Um, thank you. A couple questions and I'll open up to my colleagues. Are, is is um, BSS already using additional measures beyond PCI to determine street reconstruction needs or is this really the first time we're using all of these additional metrics? Uh, this is probably the first time we're using all the elements. In fact, it will IP out as well as the uh, uh, 311 request. So we were using some elements before, just not all of them. So, we're, so I'm sorry? We were using some things beyond PCI before, just not all of the new Correct. ones. Correct. Okay. Um, and do we have an estimate of when the new crews funded by the, by the budget, the fiscal year budget, uh, be filled and deployed? So we're actively going to hire, but we're also going to move resources around so we can start all these programs July 1st. Filling the positions, they'll, they'll get filled within a few months, but it's not going to slow us down. Yeah, we're anticipating that usually the hiring process takes a couple months, okay. but we are going to start, like I said, we're moving the crews around internally and to, to start the process. The movement of them internally going to affect anything else negatively in terms of being able to do the other projects that those folks were working on? Uh, Keith Mose, Assistant Director of Beer Street Services. So what we did with our current crew configuration uh, council member is we have a, we have We'll have eight resurfacing crews doing resurfacing work. We moved two crews out of Star Alley programs, things like that. We have other crews that um, part of that we already have that do complete streets work. That actually be doing failed streets as well at the same time. Doing what street? Fail, uh, complete streets will actually be starting a failed streets program. Okay. So we've dedicated resources specific for each uh, project. We'll also be moving resources to do concrete panel repair um, come July 1st once monies get approved um, for that type of work. We're also trying to onboard a contractor to assist us with some of this, you know, um, some of the work also as part of the $7 million for concrete street repairs. So we're bringing that on board. But come July 1st, we will start 
pretty much all elements of concrete streets, regular pavement preservation, reconstruction, alleyways, everything come to life first by moving our current resources that we have available. At the same time, we'll still be doing our hiring, uh, basically to backfill our, va our current vacancies. Come next year, we're planning, we're, as we saw the multi-year plan, we're looking at how we can be more efficient uh, next year and when basically what we can concentrate more on, say, with, say pavement preservation, failed streets, uh, you name it. So we're looking at all those elements. And as mentioned, this is the first year that we are doing a multi, you know, we've actually started the multi-year plan. By the end of the fiscal year, or by the end of the calendar year, excuse me, we plan that by the end of the calendar year, yeah. uh, right now we have the 1920 um, pavement preservation program and we're doing some other amounts of develop, developing the failed street components, but our 1920 program is pretty much ready. By July, August, we'll have the 2021 pavement preservation program ready, incorporating these elements. By the end of the calendar year, we'll have 21-22 fiscal year, the multi-year um, program, start planning it out, fleshing that out, working out the details. We'll be meeting with all the council officers to talk about everything that we're talking about at this, you know, at, at the table here. To where we're going to talk about your alleys, we're going to talk about your concrete panel repairs, we're going to talk about, you know, you name it, we're going to talk about it. Anything that within the public right-of-way that deals with asphalt or concrete, we're looking to address it. As John mentioned, we are looking to basically include, we call it a, I call it a weighted average. PCI will be the majority of the weight, say 80% hypothetically. Then we'll use 311 calls as a, as a component. We'll use pothole, uh, pothole request, litigation measures, and other things possibly to start including it and um, to basically work out a more comprehensive street pulse to equalize a pavement condition for entire neighborhoods, put everything on the same maintenance cycle. And that way, when you go, in, go into a neighborhood, I don't want to leave a, no, no street left behind. We'll do pavement preservation, we'll do slurry still, and we'll do failed streets at the same time. And uh, how many streets in each district do you think we're going to get done this year with this, the new program? Projected, uh, right now, we're looking in the neighborhood between 45 and 60 lane miles, uh, approximately, depending on, because uh, unfortunately with, uh, with 45, 60 lane miles. Total. Total. Yes. And so, yeah, and that, that's for felt streets. You're saying citywide? Yeah, it's about four lane miles per district, and but it's about four, for felt streets for asphalt, about 45 to 60 lane miles approximately. So four lane miles of the failed streets we're talking per about council four. district. Say it, say it again. Per, per this, this, and I keep saying say it again because the, the sound in here is, yeah. is so, it just, it's, not, it's not so good. For, yeah, so uh, our program. Detail. Their total failed streets based on the budget is approximately 45 to 60 lane miles citywide. Okay. Okay. All right, colleagues? Mr. Buscano? Let me, let me just first um, recognize Adele um, H. <laughs> they butcher my last name. Um, and your leadership in taking this department um, to uh, another level. And you're surrounded by uh, an amazing team here. Um, and those who are on the ground really uh, being responsive to our, our needs as it relates to streets, sidewalks, um, among other infrastructure needs throughout the city. Um, and, and thank you for that. The, um, you know, we've celebrated the fact that SB1, the state, has, has, has passed successfully thanks to the leadership in the state legislature and the $12.8 million in funding for the reconstruction of failed residential streets in the 1920 fiscal year budget. Clearly shows, you know, in, in myself and then Mitch Englander led a Save Our Streets Los Angeles initiative and felt that, you know, these dollars aren't just enough. We have the largest street network in the country. Um, and in a time where we do still need to, to lean on the federal government and improving and uh, moving forward on a long-term infrastructure bill, because we've seen so a lot of disinvestment in our infrastructure in municipalities country, throughout this country. Um, is there a reason why uh, the unimproved streets are not included in um, this allocation and, and funding? So there will be some unimproved streets, and also we're also working on withdrawn streets, and we have to basically make sure that the funding sources match. So there will be streets that do not have traditional curb and gutter. Right. They will be included in this. Anything in the public right-of-way with asphalt, we're looking at alternative measures. We're looking at uh, just simple asphalt overlays, and some may require street reconstruction. So that is a component in here. And uh, we just approved item number eight in Wilmington, so I'm happy to hear that 
there are uh, dollars available within this, this funding source to um, fix unimproved streets, correct? Yes. Okay. And um, I was alarmed to know that it's, we're only going to ha have four lane miles per district. That doesn't mean, and this is just for this specific allocation, correct? Correct. Not to say we're going to have only four, we're, we're going to have four lane miles throughout this fiscal year. Okay. You, the, the staff will meet with your office and okay. basically break down every every program that we're doing uh, for your office. I appreciate that. Office. And that's one, one last comment, if I can, an observation that I've had. You are working directly with our field staff, uh, and they, of course, are the eyes and ears uh, to, to our constituents and our neighbor council leaders, so I really appreciate that effort and working hand-in-hand hand with our field staff because they know best those concerns and complaints that we're getting on a daily basis on these impacted streets, so I appreciate that effort. Thank you, Mr. And Chair. And just, just a comment on that, we do take the priorities from your field staff from all council offices throughout the entire year. And just through our normal pavement preservation program, we interweave as many of those requests through a count from a council office permit area as many as possible within our grid system. I appreciate that. And we know your priorities lie within CD15, correct? Of thank course. you very much. <laughs> uh, Jack, but uh, no, uh, Mr. Roof. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, uh, thank you for finally bringing this uh, um, to us. And we've been working on this for a long time. And I really want to thank our chair and our, our previous chair, Joe Buscaino. I mean, we've been asking for failed streets to be addressed for a long time. And, and this is the first year. So li like Councilman Buscaino, I am a little saddened or concerned that um, we'll do about 45 to 60 lane miles for the entire city, which with our um, current failed streets and asphalt only will take about 40 years plus. But at the same time, I do want to commend the department, commend Adele, because this is the first time we've at, we're actually addressing failed streets comprehensively. So, I mean, this is something we've been fighting for for three years, I think, Joe, right, and, and, and Bob. So. I'm glad that it's $16 million, $16.6 million is allocated for the first time uh, in many, many years um, to address failed streets. And um, looking at the distribution of failed streets for asphalt lane miles, I'm supportive of the split of funds between the council districts, but I hope that when it comes to um, concrete streets, which I believe is going to come to us in August or September, uh, the formula for that that we could uh, split those funds equitably and proportionally um, for uh, failed streets in concrete. Um, because if, cause if we're trying to address our failed streets, concrete and asphalt, and raise the average PCI level efficiently, we need to ensure that we put the funding where it's most needed. To, to, to that point, um, Councilman, we basically we use a budget allocation formula for concrete trees specifically like we normally do. This is just a case where we're spreading the dollars evenly in this particular case, but when it comes to concrete, there are disproportional areas that have more concrete than others. We recognize that, and we will use a budget allocation formula specifically for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, some of my recommendation is going to be received and filed. Before we do that, I want to note that uh, Mr. O'Farrell had to leave, so uh, we still have a quorum of three, and uh, without objection, uh, the three of us will move uh, to uh, receive and file this report. Thank you so much. That takes us to item number three. Item number three is a report from the city attorney and ordinance relative to establishing a procedure for appeals to the council from environmental determinations by certain non-elected decision makers. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, council members, assistant City Attorney Tim McWilliams. Um, you will recall that your direction to our office as well as the council's direction was to bring forward an ordinance that would implement the state law that guarantees members of the public the right to appeal to the elected decision-making body any environmental determination that's uh, made by a non-elected decision-maker. And so that is what we have done, and uh, that's what's before you is our uh, uh, proposed ordinance. I can say a few things about the ordinance if you like. First of all, it's um, the application of the ordinance is, is a fairly, fairly narrow uh, category of projects that would that the ordinance would apply to. It's those projects that uh, number one are typically not seen by council to begin with. Council is not the final decision maker, uh, nor is there an existing right in the code for someone to appeal those to council. Um, this particular ordinance does not apply to things that go through the planning department. So it's further narrowed in its scope. 
um, to uh, every city department except uh, planning department and the proprietaries. Um, and so that's the scope of the application. The ordinance then sets forth. Which, which um, is most, mostly public right of way, correct? Correct. I can tell you that, and, and my colleague and I were just discussing the range of types of appeals that we have seen over the last couple of years, and it's fairly limited to things like sidewalk repairs that involve tree removals. There was a recent, maybe two weeks ago, appeal um, arising out of Council District 4 um, that was landscaping that Rec and Parks proposed uh, to implement for traffic safety reasons. Um, but other than that, it, it's frankly quite a narrow class of projects that we see being appealed under, under CEQA. There's currently no code provision setting forth what the procedures are for that appeal. So that's what this ordinance is, is designed to do, is to um, lend some um, uh, organization to the manner in which the appeals are processed, telling folks where to file them, uh, how long you have to file them, when they'll be heard. Um, um, and so I can go through the ordinance. Um, again, it, it covers wh when, to, when to file, um, when council needs to take up the matter. Uh, and does provide provide for a stay of any underlying um, decision to implement the project. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, before we before we go to questions, I, I, we have one public comment. Uh, is Mr. Doug Haynes here? Yeah, so we're going to bring you back up after public comment, but this will give you a chance to address public comment as well. Mr. Haynes, welcome. Thank you. My name is Doug Haynes. Good afternoon. I'm concerned about a number of conflicts I see within the proposed ordinance. As an example, um, the time to file. You have 10 days after filing a notice of exemption or notice of termination. Those are county filings. And so you'd have to monitor the county filings. A notice of exemption can be filed prior to an approval by the department. Also, that conflicts with the 30 days that CEQA provides. Also, on Section E2, um, within 10 days of the filing, you're required to submit all evidence and argument. That means there's no chance for rebuttal of the staff report. That also conflicts with Section G, which says that you have up to five days prior to the public meeting to submit additional arguments. So I don't understand how that functions. And also the five days, if you have a 10 days notice of a public meeting and there isn't clarity on which the public meeting is, is the public meeting within a public committee or is it within the council? Then what if you don't get the notice through the mail until after that five day period? How would you submit? Also with the exhaustion administrative remedies, it says no court challenge can occur. That conflicts with the law, uh, state law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we could bring Mr. Williams back up, I, I think one of the answers to the question has to deal with the fact that these are not things that are coming before the council. But if you could address the uh, issues, for starters, that, that uh, the member of the public, Mr. Haynes, has brought up. So the, um, the issues raised by Mr. Haynes were set forth in a letter submitted either yesterday or today by uh, Daniel Wright, um, and uh, I've reviewed the letter. There, it doesn't raise any any um, uh, any issues that I think pose a legal uh, threat to the, um, the the viability of the ordinance from from a legal perspective. Um, they're more directed at, at policy uh, issues. How how uh, the author and quite and, and Mr. Haynes' comments feels the process should work, um, but. Again, I don't think they raise any, any legal problems um, concerning the ordinance. Um, and the, the comments seek to impose requirements uh, on the city departments that don't currently exist, requirements like you must issue a written determination. That's not currently uh, in the code, and it would be, quite frankly, a very significant departure from existing practice. I think, um, and I know Mr. Haynes, I know his council, they work primarily in the planning realm, and their planning is a different world. They issue written determinations. Uh, that is not something typically done by um, the other departments. Uh, and CEQA wouldn't require it, frankly. Um, and, I mean, unless there's a specific question that's raised you want me to focus on, I can, but again, there's no legal concerns raised by the comments. Yeah, no, and in fact, I mean, I, I think it's important for you to help us understand this, which is the, the purpose of this is to create a time frame that doesn't exist now, because right now, uh, project gets started immediately and then someone could appeal it and it could be too late. Is that correct? Correct. Um, yeah, the, the idea is to, um, 
propose some structure so, so that if, if there's an appeal pending, a project would be stayed. It could not be implement, implemented until that appeal is heard, while at the same time putting a time frame on when the appeal uh, must be heard. One of the other things that's happening currently quite often is, is a member of the public will feel compelled to not only just not only file the CEQA appeal, but also file a lawsuit because they want to protect uh, their rights to proceed in litigation. So we, we find ourselves defending uh, the lawsuit while at the same time working with staff to tee up the appeal for counsel. And it's, so it's, it's an inefficient approach, not just for the city resources, but also quite frankly the public to have to f deal with it on two fronts. So this would eliminate the need to file a lawsuit until the administrative process is complete. And in terms of the timing being um, enough time for folks, is it the 10 days, it's a 10 day, 10 day, right? You get 10 days to file something and then after that you have 10 more days to get your documents together. Right, now, th now that's, that's, a, that's not a legal requirement. You have, you have great discretion to, to set that standard as, as you see fit. The, the attempt in the draft was to strike a balance between the need for important public projects to proceed expeditiously, balance that against the rights of the public to appeal these. So th the 10 days um, is the period in which you, you file your notice and then you would get an additional 10 days to marshal your evidence together and get that on file. It's very similar to when you appeal in, in a litigation context. You file your notice of appeal first and then you have a, a quite a bit of time after that to actually get all the evidence uh, together. But there's some flexibility there if the committee wanted to um, tinker with that 10 days. Are the CEQA appeal procedures in this ordinance similar to the processes that other governmental agencies and municipalities follow? Frankly, other agencies are all over the board. Some have none. Some are very um, brief um, and don't don't have as much uh, detail uh, as this one. Uh, some are uh, longer. Some are shorter periods. Some there's one that's five days. So they're they're all over the board, and the reason is because state law doesn't demand or require any particular procedures. It leaves it up to the discretion of, of the agency. So then we're left with coming up with a reasonable approach that, that protects everybody's interests. That's why it's not unprecedented on, to be either more strict or less strict than this. Oh, no. No. And then what happens if the council fails to make a decision within the allotted 75-day period? So under CEQA, you, c you can't have a deemed uh, denial of the appeal legally. You just can't have that. So council will need to take it up and act on it. Now, the, the ordinance would provide the council could continue that 75 days if, if it uh, decides there's good cause for that. Um, but the situation today is that if council does not act on an appeal, someone who thinks that council is taking too long could file a lawsuit seeking a writ to compel the city to act. So that's the state of affairs today. That'll be the state of affairs even when the ordinance is in, in effect. Um, um, yeah. Right. There's no default uh, denial by default or approval by default. That's, that's correct. Okay, great. Colleagues, do you have any additional questions or comments on this? Uh, no. Then um, I'm going to recommend that we adopt the draft ordinance as presented. Thank you. Seeing no objection, that'll be the order. Thank you. Mr. Espinosa, is there anything else on our docket? Yes, I believe we still have item number 11. 11, okay. Item number 11 is a report from the Bureau of Street Services relative to the maintenance of the city's unimproved median island. Scanning point enough. Just checking to see if you're listening. See, you know. <laughs> Mr. Spots, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to present this item because the maintenance of our four million square feet of unimproved median islands is one of the last uh, services that still hasn't been restored since the budget crisis. And um, uh, an unimproved median can be asphalt or concrete or dirt. It might have some trees in it. That it doesn't have irrigation. And left to their own devices, especially after the rains, these medians can grow weeds even as tall as a person. You can end up with all kinds of trash or even shopping carts in there. Um, it can really create blight for the community and even unhealthful conditions. And so we were very excited that a million dollars was placed in the Measure M local return schedule to begin to address the unimproved median islands. And this report is uh, our proposal on how to ac activate that money and do something with it in a timely manner. What we're recommending is a three-part approach. We're recommending the transfer of $400,000 to the Streets LA overtime account so that our street maintenance forces on weekends can 
start working right away on the biggest medians that are the greatest nu nuisances. The weeds have already grown from this big rainy season that we had and we'd like to get right after it. Um, we also recommend transferring $350,000 to the Streets LA contractual services account and we intend to use that in two different ways. $200,000 um, to spend with the contractors we already have that do the irrigated medians and give them an additive change order to do some of this work. And then we're very excited about uh, collaborating with the Bureau of Contract Administration to start a new small contractor pilot program next spring so that some of the smaller medians that can be accessed from the side of the road where it's not against fast moving traffic could be maintained by entry level contractors who previously haven't had a business opportunity with the city. And that's exciting too, to, to, to have an on-ramp for the mom-and-pop businesses to be able to, to be part of this. Um, so how are the locations for maintenance going to be selected and prioritized? We're currently doing a needs assessment. Uh, we have 24 um, maintenance district supervisors in our street maintenance division and each of them is inspecting their medians and doing a needs assessment. We think the resources provided here will allow us to get to all the medians at least once and probably twice. So um, it's still not a regular maintenance, you know, on a you know, quarterly or semi-monthly basis, but it can get us to the point where we could clean up this year's germination and also next spring's germination of weeds as well. And I know we have Ms. Choi here. Uh, I think we're here to speak on the, on the business piece. Is that right? So we'll get you in and then we'll, we'll ask questions to both of you. So Good afternoon, uh, this is Hannah Choi from the Bureau of Contract Administration and I'm just so excited for an opportunity th uh, that we can do, um, we can have an opportunity for very small businesses as a result of the funding that we have here. It's actually Greg who uh, helped me brand this program and called it community level contracting. And what you have before you is just a summary of what happened when Gary Lee Moore and John Reamer looked at the sidewalk program and thought, wow, this is a great opportunity for our very small businesses in the city where um, the, the Bureau of Engineering uh, came up with a fixed price so that our small businesses don't underbid and go out of business and have an RFQ where we can have a number of small businesses come and get on a bench and be awarded these contracts. As a result of that, three years ago, we had 35 contractors. Two thirds of them were brand new, which is unheard of. We usually get the same contractors bidding. And this is the first time where the majority of the firms were brand new. And just the diversity um, as a result of that was amazing. We had 40% local, 40% MBE, 40% SBE, 29%, emerging businesses, 9% women businesses, and 6% disabled veterans. We normally never get this kind of participation that is so diverse and reflective of our city. So we thought this is a really good program. So we approached Bureau of Sanitation and they applied the same principles to their uh, mobile truck washing, where they usually only had one contractor bid on it. And as a result, we had three bidders, and one of them is a small local business. So we're really excited that um, Street Services really looked at this, the median islands, and carved out even 150000 even if you break it down to a $25,000 pro project, is important for a small business, right? Important for those businesses in our community who just needs a chance to succeed on a city contract. And so... We're very excited, supportive, and um, looking forward to assisting them in making it a really successful program, and hopefully it'll expand to other uh, contracts throughout the city where we can just look at opportunities and carve out just a small amount so that our small businesses can compete as a prime, learn from the city family, and expand their business throughout the Southern California region, so thank you. And, and question for you, that have we improved our process sufficiently so that we can pay these small businesses on time and in an efficient manner? Because that's, these guys, they can't float. 
Definitely. So with the mayor's office, we had a, we, um, had a goal where we paid our small sidewalk contractors in a timely manner. So we are very mindful that the payments, especially to our small businesses, must be made. Um, and, and, you know, otherwise, it'll be very difficult for them. So. Thank you. Colleagues, any additional questions? All right, well then, um, I'm gonna recommend that we adopt, oh, Mr. Briscana has a question. I just had a question, so if I can't, sorry I mean, about that. This may turn the I, whole I'm thing just, around. I'm, I'm sorry, ready, sorry, sorry. I'm ready to, to, to vote no <laughs> now. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Ahead. One thing that just is banging my head around here is, you know, the, the maintenance of the, the mediums, as you mentioned, the, the weeds that emerge after a heavy rainy season. Um, is there a sustainable way to maintain these, um, I, can you just walk me through when a, when a crew comes out to a medium that is a lot of vegetation and, and, and weeds? Are these, what do they do? Do they just spray it with weed killer? Then, I mean, how, how effective is, how, how are we responding to these, these mediums? So what's proposed is to um, remove yeah, the weeds mechanically. Aren't we mechanically. banning weed killer around here? Yeah. Well, we have... Um, we have a very limited number of our staff who are certified pesticide applicators, and since the um, lot cleaning division was disbanded during the budget crisis, that's not a regular service that we generally do. Um, but we're hoping that you know these one-time or two-time cleanups can help tee up a discussion next budget season for a sustainable long-term uh, program where we would know we have existing funding and we could have some blend of in-house city staff and contractors to do a, you know, all the different modalities that would help. Okay, so right now you Right now we'd be cutting down the weeds, but down not the weeds putting and then coming back there. six months later. Yes. Yeah, it's just not a sustainable way of, of maintaining it, but it's a large network at the same time. Okay. That's what we have. Okay, colleagues, then I'm gonna recommend that we adopt the report recommendations. Seeing no objection, that'll be the order. Thank you very much. And Mr. Espinosa, I imagine this is the very last one, correct? We had nothing else on the docket? Yes, the desk is clear. All right, the desk is clear. This meeting is now adjourned.